Zoom. Uh, it is a book that we are quite proud of and uh, we look forward to share a little bit more about it in uh, the, the uh, next hour to come, also with uh, short kickoffs by some of our contributors. It's 32 chapters on posthumanism, so it's a really broad ranging book, we think, and it's a subject that really grows on you. So what is posthumanism? I mean, sometimes it's uh, defined um, close to the posthuman as a kind of a meta apparatus uh, as associated to the posthuman. But we have been maybe um, somewhat bold here and have chosen to identify it with what some people call post anthropocentrism. So, what we are after, uh, we are after all kinds of theories that disagrees um, with um, separating humans from the rest of the universe. And um, we, we, so, so we, we think that um, post-humanism is worth to make a, an umbrella term for both um, those theories which are more interconnected with uh, technology such as critical post-humanism or transhumanism but also those theories which um, maybe look at um, th um, technology from a more critical and even pessimistic angle, such as anthropocene theorizing. And then we are also um, including uh, different sorts of new materialisms, which we also think um, meet on this point of, um, of um, dissolving the exceptionalism of, of, of the human. Yes, and at the same time, uh... We think that the technologies, as, as Jakob said, are extremely important. Uh, and the day and age we live in, where we have information overloads, we have new technologies, we have the potentials of becoming cyborgs, uh, that's more of a choice than, uh, that, than, than a fantasy. Uh, some people are, depending on how you define it. All those things are something that we take into account. And we also have a sense that a lot of things that are happening in the world today uh, is not dependent so much about our capacities to change the world, but our willingness to do so. That technology is actually ahead of what we think morally that we are able to do. And that is something that we think really needs for us to have a much larger and broader vocabulary to be able to think through those uh, dilemmas that uh, occur with that. And we would like to... Um to challenge um, these uh, poles, which uh, maybe tend to separate the, the post-humanist terrain today. That is, on the one hand, um, jubilating, overly optimistic uh, transhumanism, and then on the other hand, uh, this um, Anthropocene theorizing, which uh, is kind of um, um, pessimist on, 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 uh, in judging the, the prospects of, of, of technology, and, and which also tends to to be a somewhat um, um, techno technophobic. So how can we, how can we uh, negotiate between these poles and maybe also negotiate between a concern for um, the, the human body and what becomes of it in, in, in uh, emerging um, with technology in, in a, a, a cyborgian assemblage uh, um, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, the environment which is so much the concern of uh, Anthropocene theorizing. So maybe if we really try to mingle those poles, we will also enter a terrain in which it's difficult to make the usual distinctions between body and surroundings. Maybe we're coming into a thirdness in which uh, um, space and body is, um, is intermingled in, in, in a new way. Yes. And uh, as we said, we have 32 contributors, uh, contributions to the, uh, to the volume, uh, which is organized into four parts. And we'll just very briefly say a little bit about uh, why we have composed it into uh, those parts. Uh, and perhaps you could run the slides, Sebastian, uh, and then move forward to start the slideshow and move forward to... Uh, Thank you. And then just one more, two more forwards. One and one more. And the next, please. Thank you. Yes, so, because uh, the, 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 first, um, the first section uh, we have termed uh, paradigms and transformations. Um, and we, with this paragraph, we'd like to give an, an overview of all the quite um, diverse uh, positions um, which, which constitute the, um, the post-humanist um, terrain. 
So we, we have um, a couple of articles dealing with uh, the, the humanist heritage, which um, uh, is uh, to a right degree um, deconstructed in, in post-humanism, but which also um, on certain levels uh, live on. So for instance, Harry Kukun um, shows interesting um, continuities from the Enlightenment and, and into transhumanism, uh, which is then treated by uh, Stephen Saltner. Then we have, um, we have um, ideas about the, um, the Anthropocene, um, the non-human and uh, different sorts of uh, systemic theories. We have the ahuman and speculative post-humanism. And um, finally, we also have a, an overview of um, how um, the post-human um, relates to temporalities at large in, in, in grand narratives. Yes, and uh, the next section uh, deals with uh, ethical issues, and which there are a lot of. Uh, you will hear from Ursula Heise in, the, in a short while. Uh, but as you can see uh, from the slide, we have really tried to uh, take a broad approach to things that has to do with the human body, uh, with uh, disabilities, with uh, therapy and enhancement, uh, and also with uh, the way that we treat each other, for example, with uh, race, and the whole question of uh, the unity of uh, humanity. And uh, you know, Steve Fuller should be uh, online and uh, give a short introduction to his chapter in, in a short while. Uh, and then obviously with uh, other kinds of discourses that are extremely important to, to this uh, subject. Uh, the politics of posthumanism, uh, written by Ivona Janica, who is uh, present here today, uh, as well as feminism, and which is really a subject when we started planning the book five years ago, there was really no way to see how much that uh, gender and sex has become uh, really a proponent of a lot of discourses within uh, posthumanism. And really ripping apart the whole idea about what uh, the essentials of being human means means today. Yes, and then technology, which is also extremely important. Uh, as we said uh, at the beginning, uh, that is one part and one driver of where the world goes today. And where obviously I think that uh, the humanities and the post humanities uh, need to respond. Uh, so, uh, in a similar fashion, we have also uh, devoted chapters that has to do with the ways that technologies are affecting bodies, uh, the way that uh, medicine uh, will be, can become personalized, that are open to new opportunities, the way, and that's a very transhumanist uh, subject, how uh, ideas about immortality uh, is, is, uh, is, is a part of, of what we do but also uh, sports, the way that people are willing to do things with their bodies, inject themselves with uh, performing enhancing drugs, and how that plays a part in uh, society today, and which we also think is a vital part of uh, post-humanism. And finally, of course, there are all the technologies that we surround ourselves with, the way that we have become datafied, the way that uh, we have uh, different ways of thinking about uh, education, and finally, how we're also building things that humanoid or not, uh, are really affecting the way that we think about agency uh, as we build uh, machines that are uh, autonomous or semi-autonomous around us. Yes, and maybe we should move to the final section. Sorry. Which is aesthetics. Um, because uh, with, with um, diverse sorts of intellectual thought, we can um, provide more or less precise models of uh, post-human scenarios, but the whole field of aesthetics um, of, offers more sensually engaging and also indeterminate and open ways of approaching um, um, this field, which is uh, notoriously difficult to imagine. And uh, actually, aesthetics um, as, as such will be dealt with uh, shortly with, um, um, in Alexander's uh, contribution here at the book launch. So um, I will just move on to, to the, uh, um, and mentioning some of, 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 of the other chapters. I mean, we, we, uh, we have chapters on, on the more traditional arts like um, literature uh, and, and music, um, and also moving into uh, that part of avant-garde art, which is constituted by bio art. And then uh, we cover different sorts of more popular art forms, uh, film and television, uh, comic strips um, in a digital 
passion um, anime films and and games um, and um, and with these um, we will also um, show that um, post-human imagination has actually become part of the popular imagination in, in, in the last decades. Yeah. So um, then I should maybe just uh, mention that uh, we are uh, proud of, of, of the cover uh, by Pierre Uyck, um, which um, we think is um, exactly um, being indeterminate in, in, in what it uh, depicts uh, in relation to uh, the body and, and, um, um, and, and the environment. I mean, it, I think this, this, this picture is uh, wonderfully indeterminate in, in, in dealing with um, the post-human and doesn't also fall into this trap which sometimes uh, ha haunts uh, the post-human feel, which is uh, um, depicting um, cyborgian bodies in a maybe too uh, technologically explicit manner. I, I think this is, uh, this is um, indeterminate in, in a really interesting way. Yes. And with that, uh, we just want to say that it's a book that we think it's important because it's really try an attempt to try to understand this landscape of thought that is opening. When you think about what posthumanism is, whether it's the technological oriented variation that leads to transhumanism, or it's the ecological oriented version that leads to a decentering of the humans. Both are really big thoughts uh, that, that uh, separates uh, with a lot of, 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 of common health ideas from uh, the, the particular the Western tradition of, of thinking. And it's important because it's about more, it's about responsibility, it's about an ability to react to things that are going on in the world right now. So. Uh, We'll get back at the end of this session with a lot of thank yous. Uh, but for now, uh, we'd like to hand it over to Steve Fuller, which I hope is, is, is ready. Yes, I'm uh, here. Can you hear me? Oh, that's excellent, yes. Steve. Yes, uh, that's, so, uh, yes. Yes. So Steve Fuller, now from Warwick. Uh, would you spotlight Steve? And, uh, hi, guys. Hi, welcome. OK. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, Mads and uh, Jakob for inviting me. Uh, to uh, speak at this thing. Um, I should say that uh, I think a few things, first of all, I think the kind of introduction that was given to posthumanism uh, by, by the two editors is very much on the same kind of track that I operate on, uh, especially in terms of trying to think about a kind of polarity that exists within the broad camp of posthumanism. I mean, one of which is transhumanism, which in a sense thinks we haven't been human enough in a way, that we have to ultra enlightenment, ultra human, right? We have to increase our distance from nature and to, as it were, emphasize our exceptional character. But now our exceptional nature is no longer a matter of theology, but it's a matter of, let's say, genetic engineering or uh, uploading consciousness to machines, right? In, in some sense, it involves a very strong sense of artifice, okay? Um, and so this kind of attempt to amplify the distance between uh, the human and the natural uh, is very much the transhumanism ticket. And this is very well represented in the volume, no question about it. Um, and then of course there is what you might call a post-humanism proper, um, which is in a sense, as I believe Mad said uh, just a few minutes ago, is about decentering the human, right? In a sense um, that the human is not so special, not so exceptional, right? That in a sense, um, if, if, you know, if, if we're talking about the future, part of what the future involves, and this is where the notion of the Anthropocene becomes very important, is that we have to see ourselves more integrally and organically connected to a kind of larger nature, okay? Uh, and so this is where the ecological orientation becomes very important, a kind of down-to-earth view, you might say. Um, and and post-humanism generally, I would say, is about a kind of leveling, a kind of ontological leveling right, where, where there, there is no longer a privileging of the human or specific characteristics of the human, but rather it's a matter of uh, treating all forms of being or life or whatever on an equal plane. And if humans have any kind of special role, it's in enabling that to happen, okay? And, and this is where I see post-humanism going. Um, and this raises lots of issues, and I don't think these issues are going to disappear. So even though this volume is called the Handbook of Posthumanism, and, and make mo no mistake, this is the most sophisticated 
reference work on either and both transhumanism and posthumanism that's available. And, and if you just look at stuff that was being published that were passing themselves off as uh, reference books in this area, let's say 10 years ago, you, you could definitely see a step change here, okay? Things are much more sophisticated, much more articulated. I mean, here what you have is, as it were, uh, if I may say so, something that actually looks like an alternative worldview to humanism, right? In a sort of full comprehensive sense with, with just as much complexity as one would have expected from humanism, okay? I think in, in this regard, the volume really marks a kind of step change. So it's very impressive. It's impressive across many different dimensions, okay? Um, now, I do think, however, and, and um, one of the things, one of the contexts in which I'm saying this is because um, I'm going to have to leave you guys after I speak because I'm about to teach a class. Um, and, and, and this class is for our master's students. And it's a core master's class called Understanding Social Science. So all these master's students that we've got here uh, who are specializing in many different areas of social science have to take this thing. And of course, the topic of this class, which is relevant, I think, to what we're talking about here, is that somehow we're supposed to think there's something called social science, right? Now, in light of this kind of trans posthumanism thing, what is the subject matter of social science? Now, there's not a lot of discussion about that, I have to say, in, in this volume. And I think to a large extent, people who come to either transhumanism or posthumanism generally do not have a primarily social science orientation. But the interesting thing about social science, of course, is that this is the sort of set of fields that in a way somehow thought that from a scientific standpoint, not a theological standpoint, not from a traditional humanistic standpoint, but from somehow a scientific standpoint, that there was something special about the human. And this had to do with society, right? And society was traditionally this thing that only humans had, especially if we think about it, you know, in a way of, economies and states and all the other institutions that we associate with society. So there was always this kind of human exceptionalism that was historically built into the concept of social science. Now, of course, there's been a lot of opposition to this. Um, and, you know, from biological science, I mean, forget, you know, and, and in particular, right, where, you know, there's been this long history, Darwinism in the 19th century, and up to this day, that there really isn't this kind of difference, and that in fact, society is something that's a much more general notion, and it can include non-humans of various kinds. And, and I think we're quite familiar with that as kind of a staple of post-humanist discourse now, right? But, it, but in a way, it, it, it lodges a particular threat against the social sciences as an autonomous body of knowledge that is separate from, you know, the, the natural sciences in particular, I would say, okay? Um, and so this is a very interesting kind of moment in a way from the standpoint of how we organize knowledge in the academy and how we teach it to students and so forth to be thinking about issues like transhumanism and posthumanism because it isn't simply that these viewpoints are sort of, uh, as it were, following a parallel track to humanism. It's not simply that. They're actually challenging humanism and, 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 and in a way kind of drawing to our attention the extent to which um, our normal ways of organizing knowledge within the academy really do really does presuppose human centeredness right uh, and, and the social sciences in a sense could very easily disappear you might say as a subject matter right if we really were to deconstruct the human in, a, in the kind of serious ways that both transhumanism and posthumanism uh, purport to do okay um, and, and I think that's kind of an interesting thing in a way um, you know, for us to think about, uh, you know, as one takes the ideas in this volume uh, forward, is what does the academy actually look like? How do we organize knowledge, not, not simply at the level of research, because obviously there's a lot of research in this stuff, but in terms of teaching, in terms of pedagogy, right? Like I said, I'm, gonna, I'm about to teach master's students, right? How exactly do you present this, you know, uh, as something uh, that, that one could think about, especially if one wants to be a career academic, right? Because as you all know, right, in the modern era, right, the, uh, the, the soul, the spirit of the university has been very much tied to humanism, right? Humboldt, all this jazz, right? It's about enabling 
people to realize their full humanity, right? Bildung, self-development, all that kind of stuff, right? This was a very species-specific kind of project, right? Which was very important in the establishment of the humanities as the cornerstone of the modern university in the early 19th century, okay? And then it was after that that we brought in all these other subjects. Um, but now it seems to me that if we were to take uh, transhumanism or posthumanism seriously, um, we would really have to radically rethink what we're doing here, okay? Um, and, and indeed, I mean, if you really, you know, so if you're a transhumanist, for example, and you want to think about a university, you might think about having androids as students, you know, alongside of humans in the classroom. And if you are, uh, you know, posthumanist, you might, might, might get the animals involved. Right, uh, and that you might want to talk about cross-species communication or something like that. Right, in terms of creating this kind of, um, you know, community, which in the past we have associated exclusively with humans. Right, the Republic of Letters. Think about all these metaphors about the kind of society of educated people who go to university. But now, in a sense, we are really, uh, uh, you know, potentially expanding the circle of what would be in a university. Uh, and this would mean going beyond human beings as we normally understand it. And as you well know, human beings, right, in the traditional 1.0 sense, have had a hard enough time trying to incorporate women, trying to incorporate non-whites, trying to incorporate disabled people, right? You name it, right? I mean, we've had a hard enough time with homo sapiens trying to actually bring them into the ambit of the university. But now, potentially, if we really want to make right, the transhuman and the posthuman part of this larger community of knowledge, right, we are really talking about going beyond. And the question is, how do you establish a kind of lingua franca or a curriculum or something like that that is really true to those kinds of aspirations? Now, I don't think we need to solve this problem today, of course. Uh, but I do think as we, you know, move into the next generation or two, as more and more people uh, especially younger people I'm thinking of here, right, uh, are much more, um, they kind of come in with various trans and post-human ideas as their default position, right? In other words, they expect this stuff to be taught, and respected, and all the rest of it, right? And then it seems to me this then presents this kind of much larger normative institutional challenge with regard to how the, re the university reinvents itself. And as you know, we have been under a lot of pressure as an institution, the university, to reinvent itself for all kinds of reasons, not even relating to trans and post-humanism. But this is going to be one more issue that's going to be putting a lot of pressure uh, on us as academics in the future. And I, I will stop here. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't want to go on too long because I do have to leave to go to my own class, but I hope that's okay for the time being. It is very much okay. Uh, thank you so much, Steve. We really appreciate it. Uh, uh, thank you for this engaged talk and uh, beautiful characteristics of the, of the volume. Okay. Uh, so have a, a good class. Alrighty, uh, guys. Yeah. And uh, now it's my pleasure to uh, hand over the, uh, the mic and the screen to uh, Karin Kuppenen, Professor of Literature at the uh, University of Oslo, who has written the uh, chapter on subjectivity uh, among many very strong chapters. Uh, it's uh, one that I really appreciate a lot. So, uh, Khan, uh, are you ready in Oslo? Uh, I am. You are, so please uh, yeah. go uh, ahead. May, may I share my screen? Um, I've got a couple of slides. We just need to spotlight you in a moment. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Now you should be able to see my screen, yes? Okay. Um, so as Maz uh, said, um, I wrote the chapter on self and subjectivity. Um, it's a great honor to be included um, in this really engaging and, and strong volume that, I think, as Matt rightly said, um, has a lot um, to say about very relevant uh, contemporary issues. Um, my entry on self and subjectivity actually uh, takes a longer historical view, um, but I think it is exactly because of this contemporary relevance um, that this longer historical view is of interest. If we look into definitions of subjectivity and posthumanism, 
uh, the concept immediately emerges as something that is a target of critique, as something that needs to be profoundly revised, or maybe we need to get rid of it completely. Uh, Stefan Herbrechter writes, for example, that Wolf, as Kerry Wolf and others proposed, that the tacit speciesism and anthropocentrism, which underlies the idea of subjectivity, will have to become the central target of post human critique. This idea of subjectivity is the idea of an autonomous subject, a human subject, um, that doesn't very much care about anything else. And historically, um, that notion of subjectivity is rooted um, in the Enlightenment. I'm citing uh, Rosi Bredotti, uh, who writes that this kind of subjectivity is that creature familiar to us from the Enlightenment and its legacy, the Cartesian subject of the cogito, the Kantian community of reasonable beings, or in more sociological terms, the subject as citizen, rights holder, property owner, and so on. Um, probably referring to uh, John Locke's idea of um, the individual as someone who owns property, the, the subject, um, political subject as someone who owns property. Um, so it's, it's really in the Enlightenment where all this problematic stuff um, around subjectivity seems to have begun. So, I mean, arguably it's with a very fine sense of irony that Mass and Jakob asked me as someone who is a specialist in um, the 18th century uh, to write this entry. I think one of the problems of um, the Enlightenment is that its defenders uh, are not the kind of defenders that you would like to have. I'm referring here to one example, which is uh, Stephen Pinker's high profile book, Enlightenment Now, um, that was recommended by Bill Gates as, I quote, my new favorite book of all time, unquote. Pinker makes a case um, that is very optimistic about the development uh, of the human species across the last couple of hundred years, and he links that to enlightenment uh, achievements of reason, science, humanism, and progress. Um, Pinker was reviewed quite extensively uh, in the 18th century research literature and um, was found to be wanting. Uh, not surprisingly, because, for example, a case for reason uh, is something that's, if you want to have it, you know, straightforwardly and without any um, hesitation, is something that you probably won't really find in the 18th century. You only need to read a couple of pages from David Hume's inquiry concerning understanding uh, to see that the idea of reason um, is something very tenuous. Uh, in the period. They are not at all sure. They know even what reason exactly is and how it works. The case for science and progress uh, is something which Voltaire uh, caricatures uh, mercilessly with uh, Dr. Pongloss in his novel Candide. Um, and Hume and Voltaire are not exactly marginal figures of the Enlightenment. So I think in order to understand the Enlightenment, we need to have a closer look at it, and I think that closer look will also reveal um, that in many ways the 18th century is uh, a common traveler, a fellow traveler uh, of posthumanism. Because the Enlightenment uh, is a century that is profoundly unstable, it's a century that's interested in uh, discussion and debate, and what uh, at a very quick glance looks like a rabbit um, when you keep looking at it, it starts shifting around between ducks and rabbits. Uh, it starts shifting around between different perspectives taken um, in the public discourse at the time. I'd like to show this very briefly with um, a tagline that's often been attached to um, this idea of um, anthropocentrism, and that is the proper study of mankind is my, man which is uh, a verse from Alexander Pope's essay on man. However, if you go beyond the individual verse, you very quickly find um, that Pope is actually not um, blowing the trumpet of uh, human superiority. This is at the beginning of Epistle 2. He writes, Know then thyself, presume not God to scan, the proper study of mankind is man. So to say, the proper study of mankind is man actually means that um, we have 
uh, limitations to our knowledge. Uh, know thyself, um, the Socratic um, statement is profoundly about the limits of our, of our understanding. God um, in this 18th century worldview is something so enormous. God and the cosmos is something so enormous that we cannot uh, grasp. He continues, he, man, it's not even clear what man is and how man should operate. He hangs between, in doubt to act or rest, in doubt to deem himself a god or beast, in doubt his mind or body to prefer, born but to die, and reasoning but to err. Alike in ignorance, his reasons such, whether he thinks too little or too much. So whenever we reason, uh, we usually get it wrong. We're not only reasoning to err, um, we're profoundly ignorant. And whenever we try to think, it's either too much or too little. It's very difficult um, to get this right. So Pope's essay on man, in many ways, prefigures, um, I think, many of the conceptual issues underlying um, post-humanism, uh, many of the doubts uh, and uncertainties around what it is um, to be human and what this relationality uh, in the world um, actually means. Upon reading it uh, again, the essay on man, one might even talk about God uh, as a kind of hyper object uh, in this 18th century worldview, as something that's ineffable and you can't really perceive it, but you keep bumping up against it and it keeps giving you um, trouble. So Alexander Pope's essay on man is an example of how the Enlightenment or the 18th century already addresses some of these issues um, that are so central uh, to posthumanism, as uh, Steve has pointed out. Of course, Pope's essay on man is, is not unproblematic. You will have noticed that he refers to man um, exclusively as he. Um, the 18th century is not um, the 21st century. But, um, and I will try to continue that argument, it's a very interesting partner in conversation, exactly because it keeps shifting back and forth between multiple positions. I'll skip this. Um, and I would like to um, introduce quite briefly um, three possible uh, conversation partners. One is Emilie du Châtelet, uh, the French uh, scholar and scientist who translated Newton into French in, in the 18th century, and who also wrote her own uh, treatise on physics, on natural philosophy, the Institution, in which um, she looks at the profound continuity um, between humanity, animals, plants, and even minerals and rocks. So this kind of ontological leveling uh, that we've just heard about is something which you already find in natural philosophy uh, from the time for example, in Émilie uh, du Châtelet. Another example of um, a ready conversation partner, I think, for posthumanism is La Maîtrise uh, aux Machines, uh, Man a Machine, where he basically makes the daring uh, argument that we're machines all the way down. Um, so there is nothing left of any sense of uh, human exceptionalism. And La Maîtrise, um, stands in a very long tradition, in fact, of materialist thinking, which goes back to first Spinoza and, and then uh, Lucretius, and which you find in many other places uh, in the 18th century. Uh, for example, Diderot's um, philosophical and, and literary uh, treatises are also places where quite radical uh, thinking about how far you can take ideas like man uh, a machine or man, a plant. This is another treatise by La Maitrie, how far you can take that. A third example is Bernard um, Mondeville or Bernard Mandeville uh, and his fable of the bees, where he devises uh, an understanding of human society on the model of uh, the community of bees. Um, and this understanding of society is one of a self-organizing system where you've got individuals doing things, um, but they don't understand the system as a whole. They don't understand the uh, long-term consequences of their actions. 
uh, their intentions do not necessarily match with uh, the effects in the larger networked um, society. Mandeville um, was someone who was profoundly influential, for example, for Adam Smith and his uh, Commonwealth of Nations, but also for Immanuel Kant um, and his um, discussion of interpersonal responsibility, for example. So Chatelet, Lamitri and Mandeville might at first glance not be central figures of the Enlightenment, but their thought uh, in this larger debate that I was invoking had a profound influence. So I think the 18th century and the Enlightenment is someone who shot, is, is a, a context that should not be um, brushed aside too easily. I'm not making a case for the Enlightenment because uh, I would be nostalgic for it in any way. Um, I know full well that in order to lead the kind of life that I lead now, I would have to be a French aristocrat like Émilie de Châtelet. And she died in her early 40s in childbirth. Um, the uh, intellectual um, contexts are profoundly different. But I think it's exactly that different that makes it exciting to look at uh, similarities and how they play out in these different um, thought worlds of the Enlightenment and post-humanism. Because when you look at a list of features of subjectivity that is relevant for post-humanism, entanglements between the self and environment, entanglements between animal and human experience, and subjectivity in a mediated and technological age, um, the links are relatively close. Uh, and I haven't even talked about the Industrial Revolution and the Media Revolution, where printed matter um, started to circulate ever more rapidly, ever more um, in ever more increased volume uh, throughout the 18th century. This is an age where the understanding of self and environment, the understanding of human experience in relation to other kinds of experience and technology were really at the center of discussion. And I would like, as I said, to make a plea um, to look at not Stephen Pinker or anyone else who gives uh, a narrow image of the Enlightenment, um, but to really go to these um, fabulous people who were very much in love with arguing uh, with each other and, and really knew how to do it, um, to go back uh, to those sources. Thank you so much, Khan, uh, not just for the uh, very well argued uh, presentation, but also for highlighting the historical dimension of the book, which is found obviously in your chapter, but also in numerous other chapters. The first chapter is on humanism, uh, which is, of course, I think, the right place to start uh, for a book on post-humanism. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And uh, now I'm happy to uh, invite uh, Ursula K. Heisen, who is a professor of English uh, literature and a professor at the Institute for the Environment and Sustainability at uh, UCLA in uh, California, uh, it's where it's early morning. But uh, thank you so much, uh, Ursula, for being with us today. Ursula has written the uh, chapter on environmentalisms and post-humanisms, which of course is also one of the central chapters in a book that has to do with how do we think beyond the human, how do we think about what is justice and what is righteousness uh, beyond the human scope. So uh, please, Ursula, if you're ready, uh, then the screen and uh, the mic is yours. Good morning, Mats, and good morning, everybody. Yeah, it is indeed. It's uh, just after eight here on the, on the west coast of the United States. Um, is the sound okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you perfectly. Great. You just um, need to uh, highlight your, spotlight your video. Okay. And there there you we go. go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so 
thank you for to um, Mats and Jakob for for this volume. I know this must have been a, a massive undertaking. Um, bringing together and editing thirty two essays is is a is a massive undertaking, and so um, I really look forward to receiving the book. So far, I've just gotten a, a PDF via email. The mail, as you know, in the United States is a little bit iffy these days, so it may take a while longer. Um, I uh, was delighted to take on the uh, the task of thinking about posthumanism and environmentalism when Moz asked me to do it, um, because that those are issues that I've been thinking about for for at least you know a decade and a half now. Um, but I also found that it was actually a much much harder task than I had initially anticipated because there is not one posthumanism in my view of the scene but many different ones. And there are certainly many different kinds of environmentalisms and different strains of environmentalist thought that have evolved since the 1960s. If, if you even want to set that as your beginning point, you could, of course, um, trace uh, environmental thinking of, of various kinds back to at least the um, early 19th century. So, so the um, historical thinking that Professor Kukonen foregrounded, I think, is really important for environmentalism, too, as is cross-cultural thinking. I mean, there are just different kinds of environmentalisms uh, in the world today that approach what look from a scientific perspective like similar problems, biodiversity loss, pollution, climate change, within, from within very different cultural frameworks and with different, um, with different historical memories. So I'm originally from Germany and have always been struck by just how different um, American environmentalists approach some of the issues that German environmentalists are also talking about. So that's just within the so-called West. Um, you even have really, really crucial differences. And then when you look at Latin American environmentalisms, um, Japanese environmentalism, Vietnamese environmentalism, you really get very, very different um, perspectives. Um, so the difficulty for me was sorting out, um, you know, how I was going to talk about the convergences and conflicts between these many different, this plurality of, of posthumanisms as well as environmentalisms. And so I chose to focus my essay sort of around three focal questions um, that I um, try to signal through a combination of an abstract concept and then a concrete, um, a concrete species or a concrete substance. Um, so, the, so the first issue um, that I was seeking to address was the way in which environmentalism wants to understand humans as part of ecosystems and as part of um, a, a spectrum of species where we are just one species among many. That arguably is a form of posthumanism. It is a frontal questioning of the centrality and exceptionality and singularity um, of humans. And that has always been part and parcel of environmental thinking. Um, so there's certainly a, a, a convergence there between environmental thinking and the thrust of much um, post-humanist thought. But what's interesting is that that has always been in tension with other strains of environmentalist thought. Um, and I highlight a few of those in the essay. So one is the tension um, with the emphasis on wilderness, pristine nature as the kind of nature that we should most value and try to preserve, as opposed to other kinds of nature that have already been humanly altered. Um, so the contradiction there is that if we postulate that uh, nature untrammeled by humans is the best kind of nature, then we are de facto setting humans apart from the rest of nature. So, so that conflicts with the idea that humans are just part of nature. Another corollary um, of the wilderness thinking is that, of course, in many parts of the world, wilderness is something that is managed and stewarded in all kinds of ways. Um, the national parks in the United States, nature reserves um, across Europe, um, are constantly monitored, managed, um, adjusted, manipulated by humans. So in some sense, um, to the extent that you even believe that untouched nature is um, what we should aim for in environmentalism, and not all environmentalists do. But if you assume that, I mean, even that is, it is a very human-created and human-maintained um, kind of thing. 
in the real world today. And the very idea, of course, that we are called upon to manage and steward nature, um, again, sets us apart from nature and gives us an exceptional role that ostensibly environmentalism questions. Um, added to that, and this I did not have room to discuss in great detail in the, in the essay, but a lot of the ways in which we monitor and manage nature today are heavily mediated by technology. So, I mean, every single graph you've ever seen um, of climate change and global um, rises in temperatures, frequency of hurricanes, frequency of wildfires, and so forth, of course, are heavily mediated by technology. So, um, to the extent that we are embedded in nature, it is, of course, through technology, all the way from the Gore-Tex outfits and boots that we wear when we go out to the binoculars we carry and the, um, the high-tech monitoring systems of wildlife as well as meteorological systems that we use today. So in all of these ways, there is, in some sense, um, a contradiction built into the assumption that humans are um, just part of nature and just one species among others that has been sort of hardwired into many kinds of environmentalist thought um, right from the get-go. The second aspect um, that, um, that I um, address in the, in the essay is the question of the Anthropocene and the question of the human species as an agent. And if in the first part of the essay, a foreground, um, the deep ecological idea derived from the, um, from the uh, Norwegian philosopher Arne Ness that humans are no more complex or interesting than any species of lichen. And the second one, I'm interested in the comparison of humans to a meteor, to a geological force that has been made by the um, paleoanthropologist um, Roger Leakey, um, where, um, uh, sorry, Richard Leakey, um, where he uh, um, says that, you know, um, a, a majority of species were um, destroyed 65 million years ago through the impact of a meteor on Earth, not just the dinosaurs, whom we love to still look back at, but also 80 to 90 percent of other species on Earth. And he and other environmentalists and ecologists who <coughs> focus on biodiversity loss compare the impact of the human species today to the impact of that meteor. So it's a different kind of way of thinking post-humanly um, about, um, about humans. And the question that arises in the context of the so-called age of the human, the Anthropocene, is uh, the, the question of how we reconcile the idea that humans are part of nature and just one species among others with the idea of our special responsibility. And that was already alluded, I think, in Stephen's talk um, uh, about half an hour ago. So um, what is humans' responsibility? I mean, we don't call on elephants to please stop eating um, massive amounts of vegetation because that's harmful to African, African ecosystems in a lot of contexts. We don't, you know, um, enjoin our our domestic cats to please not go outside on the patio and kill songbirds or lizards. Um, we do not have the expectation that other species manage their ecosystems. We are the only species to whom we attribute that responsibility. So isn't there a contradiction in the thought that we are just part of ecosystems and part of nature on one hand, and on the other hand, the idea that we do have some kind of special responsibility to preserve um, uh, and maybe even enhance, restore and maybe even enhance um, natural ecosystems. Um, and of course, there's um, a second set of debates that has evolved around the Anthropocene, and that is um, the uh, question of whether we should even talk about the human species um, as an entity. What does that mean? And especially people who are interested in climate change have very strongly objected to that and say, no, it's not the human species. That is, um, that is causing climate change. It's a very particular subset of the human species, mostly um, the populations of industrialized countries, certain industrialized countries such as the United States, far more so than others. So um, to say that the human species is causing climate change is in some, in some sense to obscure the enormous inequalities that have structured our interactions with nature and where the people who most who most have most contributed to causing climate change are not the ones who most suffer from 
uh, their impacts. Although, you know, here in California um, and on the West Coast in general, as you know, um, recently the impacts have been very visible and very experienceable at a, at a ground level. Um, but it is true that it is um, often populations of um, countries in the global south who are, have least contributed to climate change, who are now most suffering the consequences um, of flooding um, and of, of increased drought, increased um, in, uh, rising sea levels, um, and so on. So the question of why we should even talk about something like the Anthropocene has been strongly contested, especially by Marxist scholars such as Jason Moore or Slavo Žižek, to say that even talking about the human species as, an, as a global agent and let alone to talk about us as a sort of uh, meteoric geological force actually obscures um, the fundamental economic and social inequalities that still structure our interactions with nature. So that has been a, a huge point of contention um, in um, discussions of the Anthropocene. Um, and so that question of how we should envision humans as agents or the human species as one agent um, is a crucial question um, of posthumanism. Um, that is, how do we how do we think about how do we postulate something like the human or something like the posthuman um, at this very general level that then tends to produce what people have called these flattened ontologies. That is, you know, a leveling out of differences that in other contexts you might. Um, think are important to consider. And that brought me to the third part of my essay, which focuses on justi uh, justice and on toxins. Um, and the whole question of how, from the beginnings of the environmental justice movement in the 1980s, that postulation of a species agent really has been contested by those strains of environmentalism that want to emphasize that, um, not just in terms of climate change, but also in terms of questions of pollution of where toxic waste sites are located, where toxic industries are located, where the most hazardous housing and jobs are. Um, there has always been, there have been huge gaps between different groups of, uh, of humans and some have had less access to the benefits of nature, less access to park, um, less access to international travel and the beauty of national parks, um, less access to clean air and clean water and uncontaminated soils than others. And those same groups tend to also have experienced um, the greatest problems from pollution um, as well as rising sea levels, deforestation, and so forth. Um, so the question of justice and how we should think humanism, post-humanism um, in connection with justice, I think is a really, is a really urgent one. Um, and it's not uh, coincidental that it is indigenous studies scholars and post-colonial scholars um, who have been most skeptical, frankly, of the rise of post-humanism. Um, and some of them say that very clearly, that they say, why are we talking about post-humanism at exactly the moment when a lot of populations that have not had, have not, have not had access to human rights are claiming their access to humanism? And um, at a moment when populations who have been traditionally been relegated outside of the realm of the human along the lines that, um, that uh, Carrie Wolf outlines, but also post-colonial scholars such as Graham Huggin and Helen Tiffin, when populations that have been sort of classified as animal are finally successfully claiming access to human rights, why are we, meaning perhaps mostly in the global north, um, scholars moving on to post-humanism? And I think that's something that those of us who are interested in post-humanism have to take very seriously um, as a challenge to our way of thinking. Um, so I have tried to think humanism and post-humanism very much in the context of justice um, over the last 10 years, environmental justice in particular. And I've, um, since environmental justice tends to focus um, on the conflicts between different groups of humans in their access to nature and their risks, from, um, uh, from uh, natural catastrophes and contamination. I've tried to twist that a little bit by focusing on the question of multi-species justice. That is, how do we, how do we uh, calibrate issues of justice against the background of vastly differing understandings of what justice constitutes in the context of our interactions with nature? But how do we also think about the claims on our moral consideration 
of different groups of humans with very different degrees of privilege and different groups of non-humans, that is the plants and animals and the microorganisms that co-inhabit the planet with us and who are often left um, at the threshold when it comes to talking about justice. So multi-species justice is sort of a way of thinking post-humanistically within a context of justice. Thank you so much, Ursula. Uh, brilliant. Uh, you really gave a, a fantastic uh, overview of your article and related issues. Uh, I can also warmly recommend uh, for, for the audience uh, your book, uh, Imagining Extinction, where the same uh, connections between the way that we think about uh, the environment also spills over to the way that we uh, treat each other. Uh, that's a, at least what I find is some of the most uh, moving parts of, of, uh, of your 2016 book uh, that came out with your, the University of Chicago Press. So thank you very much, uh, Ursula. Thank you, Mats. <laughs> yeah, and, and of course, uh, as it's, it's the case with Steve and Kai and, and, uh, and Ursula, we would love to have flown you all in and uh, we look forward to a future where we can, uh, can meet at, at Aarhus again. Uh, that would be wonderful. For, for our last speaker today, uh, I'm very pleased to invite Alexander Wilson to the stage. Uh, he is actually here, has come up from Berlin, but uh, Alexander is uh, uh, also a former postdoc uh, at the University of Aarhus. Uh, he uh, worked with uh, Jakob and I on our project post uh from 2014 to 18, and it was a, a, a great pleasure. We're very happy that you have contributed to the book. Uh, that you have been moderating today and that you are back here at Aarhus and we look forward to hear you uh, talk about uh, your contribution to the book which is on uh, aesthetics. Well, right. the floor is yours, Alexander. So yeah, my, I, um, I'm sorry to disappoint anyone who wanted to uh, hear me talk about aesthetics because I, my, my chapter in the book is uh, what aesthetics tells us about post-humans and I had to compress it only to the second part of that, the, what it tells us about posthumans. So I'll let you go to the chapter to see the whole treatment of aesthetics. So I end my chapter with a, some provisional good, bad, and ugly assertions we can make about posthuman disconnection based on this, uh, the, these considerations. I'll go over some of those here and I kind of uh, sketch those out. First, uh, central to uh, the discussion, as we've heard several times today, um, is the noted challenge of how to define the human, uh, the define the post-human without first grasping a firm definition of uh, the human. We don't know which criteria strictly define the boundary. In my chapter, I draw on the concept of Markov blanket uh, from Carl Friston's thermodynamic Bayesian theory of cognition to discuss this boundary between humans and non-humans or between an individual and its environment. Consider how a drop, a, a drop of ink uh, in a glass of water immediately disperses. If for a brief moment, an observer has evidence of a distinction between the ink and the water, uh, as time passes, the ink dissolves and the distinction disappears. Uh, a living organism, by contrast, tries to prevent such transitions, according to the Bayesian theory, by minimizing uh, free energy and thus limiting its states, the system continually perpetuates the distinction, the boundary between itself and its environment. Any life-threatening transition a living being strives to avoid can be understood as the interior's dispersion uh, into the greater environment. We can say, therefore, that uh, organisms are inherently boundary-defending systems. They are constituted teleologically as systems that try to maximize evidence of a distinction between inside and outside. According to this view, an organism is a dynamic system that maximizes evidence of its difference from the rest of the world. Now, most humans strive to eat when they're hungry, sleep when they're tired, and so on. We generally obey this law of self-preservation, and thus the maximization of our boundary with the greater world. But of course, there are always exceptions to such rules. Which boundary with the world is a person trying to optimize when they say, adopt a practice uh, 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 of an extreme sport like base jumping or take up a, a, a known lifespan shortening habit like cigarette smoking. Because such behaviors seem to go against the self-preservation evolution commits us to, um, evolutionary psychology tends to regard them as byproducts of other adapted traits 
or as supernormal or peak shifted responses to environmental stimuli. The problem with such accounts is that there's no straightforward way of confirming that a given behavioral trait results from a specific adaptation, and thus no way to distingu distinguish between adaptive behaviors and their byproducts. Accounts that fail to recognize this are what Stephen Jay Gould criticizes, just so stories. Such narratives end up telling us more about what we speculators are optimizing in our own perspective on the world than they do about how the world actually is out there. Similarly, there is no straightforward way of clear, clearly and distinctly stating the boundary uh, for a given organism, let alone a whole species. But even if we can't define the human boundary precisely, we can still define the post-human, as David Roden does, as a wide human descendant that, for whatever reason, has butted off and begun optimizing a, ba a boundary significantly different from the ones humans optimize. These hypothetical post-humans might be said to construct uh, niches different from our own and live in worlds that we cannot currently comprehend from our frame of reference. The emergence in our descendants of a model optimization process that is significantly different from our own would correspond, I argue, to post-human disconnection. The problem, of course, is how to define significantly different. What minimum degree of difference with our world model would constitute a true post-human disconnection? It is difficult to answer since uh, we know that in all cases, the boundary between an, uh, an organism and its world is mobile. The organism's process of living and learning uh, from its environment is necessarily historical and path dependent. The organism is its model of the world. Each new datum learned, each new surprising experience commits the organism to an adjustment of its world model. An organism's horizon of expectation, its model of the world is constantly shifting and is repeatedly updated given new perturbations at the boundary. This tells us that distinguishing one organism from another is a matter of granularity, the level of description at which we define them. So first, the good. Um, a somewhat positive assertion this account allows us to make about post-human disconnection. Two different organisms or two different species can sometimes be said to share a common boundary and thus inhabit a world, a, a common world at a certain level of description such as is the case of symbiogenesis, two different organisms or species or societies may grow together, assimilate with each other, and come to converge on a common model of the boundary between inside and outside. Uh, there are telling examples in anthropology of human tribes that historically did not classify other members, uh, classify members of other races and tribes as uh, human. If today most humans understand their belonging to a common species, we can assume that these earlier models of the human will have grown together and fused into a larger, more inclusive one, or perhaps that even uh, that the level of description at which the boundaries are drawn will have been swapped for a relatively coarser grained model. The emergence of the modern con con concept of humanism was no doubt to some extent the statistical convergence of the Markov blankets of many different groups of people who previously could not conceive of themselves as inhabiting the same world or belonging to the same group. The contemporary conception of the global village may point to the further fusion of uh, the Markov blankets of different human populations, at least to some very coarse grained level of description. If post-humans were to appear then, owing to the concept of disconnection, it is safe to assume that we would not immediately include them into this boundary they would likely appear alien to us, but there's nothing preventing us from eventually accepting them and including them into a renewed, more inclusive definition of the human and thus of aligning our inferential models of the world with theirs. Now the bad, unfortunately, this, accounts, this account also exposes certain limitations on how we may plan to thwart un unwanted effects of, of a post-human disconnection. The term friendly AI has been promoted as a flavor of artificial intelligence designed such that priorities and interests converge with human interests. Um, uh, there are plenty of fears that the intelligence explosion will lead to a distributed AGI that enslaves humans or squashes them as we do household insects. Uh, the prospect of friendly AI, AI echoes the, uh, Isaac Asimov's famous uh, three laws of robotics. But the problem is that it is never straightforward to explicitly specify 
at the operational level what such restrictions on AI's behavior imply. The problem has much to do with the infamous faint frame problem in artificial intelligence, the idea that is never perfectly distinct, how to prioritize changes in the world model given to uh, new information, uh, given new information we gain about the world. In order to actively and intelligently carry out tasks in the world, a robot needs to be needs to know um, what to expect, uh, how the world uh, will change uh, given certain potential actions on the world. It thus has to know which information is relevant to each task. The problem is that, again, there is no complete account of what is relevant to what is and what is irrelevant to every task. A programmer would need to explicitly code a potentially infinite series of items to ignore, and the robot would get stuck at every step going through the list trying to make sure it is not considering anything irrelevant. Since, since each task has an unlimited range of potential repercussions, the chain of effects of each action in the world regresses through an infinite cascade of contexts. Uh, if one had to clearly state them, one would uh, never have the time to do so before the task lost its pragmatic value. Uh, by the time the robot decided whether it was okay to turn the knob, its gears would have long rusted together. Organisms, on the other hand, are inherently programmed by millions of years of natural selection to act before it's too late. How do they do this? Well, according to the Bayesian view, again, uh, organisms are made up of many nested organic processes, each optimizing evidence of their boundary with the world. Uh, there is no need for a specific level of inferential activity to explicitly, explicitly state all the details of the inferential processes happening one, two, or several levels down the hierarchy. The process happens in a distributed, nested fashion with each individual level computing only how to reduce the discrepancy between its input and, uh, and its expected model. Uh, the rest is left up to the in instinctual, the implicit, the reflexive, and other, in other words, the autopiloted inferential processes of the levels below. The difficulty with engineering friendly AI, however, is that we are forced to work from the top down. Even with something as simple as Asimov's laws, uh, we would uh, need to explicitly state what exactly humans are, uh, sift through the complexes of desires, boundaries, and norms that constitute us as a species, and then translate these into a series of operations that could be programmed as algorithms. But this series of operations is aesthetic, I claim, rather than noetic, it is indistinct, and even if it is objectively computable and decidable in operational terms, it is intractable and undecidable without resorting to arbitrary shortcuts. This means that the prospect of converging with our post-human descend descendants may be very difficult. Though not impossible, there is no clear-cut path to such a healthy convergence. And finally, the ugly. This account also entails a rather ugly consequence for any speculation about post-humans, for it ultimately serves to dissolve the concepts of human, non-human, and post-human altogether. Indeed, the observation that all organisms are sets of nested societies of semi-autonomous free energy reduction processes, and that they sometimes converge into symbiotic entanglements and couplings into effect, to effectively share a common boundary, while at other times diverge and start climbing into different niche habitats, uh, implies that any definition we may offer of the human boundary will no doubt be nothing more than a just-so story. It clearly shows us that, there, that all definitions of the boundary between humans and post-humans, and indeed any boundary between humans and non-humans, is somewhat arbitrary. For following the, the, the general Bayesian scheme, any assertion we make about the boundary is unavoidably circular. Um, as soon as we try to define the human, we are necessarily injecting into that definition some optimization of the model we already have uh, for ourselves and our difference from other things. More specifically, since we are organisms, we are conditioned to see the world in ways that on average favor our continued existence within it. We are bootstrapping our boundary into existence every time we observe or infer anything about the world. This is indeed what happens uh, in all essentialist characterizations of humans, you know, rational animal, technological animal, creative animal, and so on. 
If by contrast, we were to conceive of ourselves as vegetable animals, perhaps we would start optimizing ourselves such that we would eventually evolve into photosynthesizing beings. However, the point is that every time we try to define this mobile boundary, we always arrive too late. We, always, uh, we have always already injected the outside into our definition of the inside. For indeed, to define the inside is always to contaminate it with the outside. We gain information about the outside at the boundary and produce an inside which is a reflection of that outside, such that, such that the outside is continuous, uh, continuously furnishing the inside. We are made of what we are not and are continually constructing ourselves out of the other, defining the other in terms of what it is we are always already optimizing for. Every time we say this is human or the human is this, we are inevitably injecting the outside, that is the non-human, the post-human, into our definition of the human, suggesting that any attempt at definition is futile. Thank you so much, Alexander. Uh, wow, uh, what four amazing uh, short uh, speeches uh, and hope that gives a glimpse about uh, what this not little book uh, is about. And uh, we have a few thank yous we'd like to, uh, to say to people. Uh, first of all, uh, to the contributors, there are 31 besides Jacob and I. Uh, Stephen Sorkner wrote two chapters. Uh, and there are two co-authored chapters. So to all of you who have contributed to the book, uh, thank you so much. And I think it, it was in, interesting to, to hear um, these, these talks uh, touching upon so, so, so different subjects and then nevertheless uh, suddenly um, um, meeting on, on, on certain um, issues. I, 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 was, I was struck uh, by uh, how both uh, Steve Fuller and and Ursula Heise um, touched upon this 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 theme of um, the the borders of the human. I mean that that uh, Steve Fuller said that um, that that universities are built up uh, uh, upon this this um, ideal of building becoming human, and uh, then how difficult it is to to extend this 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 notion. So. What what should uh, university curricula uh, co consist of? If if for instance we should um, teach androids, um, and then Ursula Heise saying um, that um, it um, I mean we have had so 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 much uh, difficulties of of um, including um, excluded minorities in, into the um, category of the human, and in in the moment when we are maybe struggling to to really get them, then um, some of us will extend um, uh, humanity, so um, uh, extend humanity towards all um, sorts of, 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 of natural um, inhabitants. So can, can we can we um, grasp um, all all these um, het heterogeneous um, um, actions um, in in a politics? Yeah. And to pick up on uh, Alexander's viewpoint, and uh, also one of the speeches this afternoon, uh, the title, Who's Afraid of the Post-Human? Uh, I think there's a lot of fear of the post-human. I think part of the reason why the Anthropocene is, uh, is, is popular, uh, which is, is, is a, perhaps a wrong way of phrasing it, but it does have that property that it does not uh, suggest that we are not the last advanced species on the earth that there might be some, someone after us that are more advanced. And that's again one of the big thoughts of posthumanism, which uh, the arts, uh, be it uh, visual arts, uh, film, literature, and so on, are not afraid of tackling, actually find is thrilling in, in so many ways, but which is something that we are much more reluctant to think of, but which is, I think, at the current uh, situation and with the way that technology is, is developing, something that we really have to con consider. And, and think about uh, some of the uh, visionaries uh, in the arts, for example, Stanley Kubrick in his uh, movie uh, uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, uh, where you really have all the post-human and evolutionary themes uh, in there. 
uh, prior to the technologies that we today laugh off as being sort of uh, primitive and way outdated, uh, but essentially striking all the same notes that we are trying to investigate today. I had a few more thanks actually, uh, uh, just for the record. Uh, I would like to thank uh, everybody at Bloomsbury who worked with us, in particular David Avatar, uh, a long time editor who suggested the volume uh, and also to Ben Doyle and Lucy Brown, uh, who as an editor and an assistant to the editor has been uh, working with us. Uh, it's been a pleasure and to the whole copy editing team, uh, which is located in, in uh, India, uh, it has been a, a remarkable easy job to, to work with you. And we'd also like to thank uh, the Faculty of Arts at Aarhus University, who through the uh, Human Futures Network have supported uh, research and also it's a disciplinary research uh, in this field, and not least our two good colleagues, uh, Johanna Seibt and uh, Katrina Hesse, uh, both professors in uh, uh, philosophy and education, respectively, who has contributed to the book and also uh, given us so much valuable inspiration in the past few years. And maybe we should also just uh, thank the, the, the Danish Research Council who uh, in a way, uh, started uh, the, the ground, uh, the growing ground for this, um, um, in which uh, Penille was part, and also Alexander and um, and Ivona was also in the periphery of it. So I, I think that was that was uh, an important platform for developing the new ideas. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I thank you to our student helper Miriam Ta, uh, who uh, really helped keep in track on all the uh, contributions that came in uh, in different orders uh, and helped really make it uh, much easier for us to focus on the editorial uh, task. I think that's about it. Uh, it's been a long day at Aarhus. Uh, uh, for those who came uh, at, at 4.30, uh, the people in the room and probably a lot of people at Zoom has been uh, going on since uh, 10 o'clock this, uh, this morning and we will continue tomorrow. Uh, it has been a pleasure. Time has just flown away. And uh, for everybody in the room, uh, please come take a look at the book. Uh, and uh, for everybody who uh, wants to get a hand of it, it's still a bit expensive. There will be a paperback. Uh, most of it, uh, not sorry, not most of it, a, a huge sample is available uh, on the Kindle store. So you can read the introduction in the first few chapters. Uh, and I'm sure that every research library that uh, wants to be respectable will have a copy of it. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, yeah, come take a look. Thank you. Great. I'm going to stop this all about.